Howdy. What was that? All right. Hey, I know I figured this out years ago that the human mind can only absorb as, the, as much as the butt can take. Let's all stand up and shake it off a minute. Come on, stand up. And while you're standing, I'll just keep talking, okay? But stand up, shake it off a little bit. Look good. All right, I have a really nice little talk here prepared for it, and I guess I'm going to have to chunk it because go ahead and sit down, whatever feels good. I guess I'm just going to have to chunk it because uh, in that incredible documentary and with the, uh, all of the uh, messages that Alex Jones just brought to you, he pretty well touched on about everything I had to say. In fact, i got to tell you that that was a tough act to follow. I feel like I'm up here trying to show you my kitty cat after you just came out of seeing Siegfried and Roy. Oh, uh, wing it. We're talking about fear. We're talking about how these they, they try to uh, corral you. And uh, let, let me share this with you. In January of 1945, Germany was being bombed by day by the Americans and by night by the British. All of their major cities and even some of their secondary cities. What's the matter? Can nobody hear? We good? All right. Their cities were in ruins, even their secondary cities were in ruins, and yet in January of 1945, with this evidence of defeat all around them, the German war production was higher than it had been in 1940, when they were riding high, okay, and had everything going for them. Now, why was that? I'll tell you, it was two things. One, propaganda. They had total control over the media, which at that time did not include television, but they had radio and newspapers and magazines tightly controlled by the Nazi regime. And they were told, don't worry folks, everything's okay. Uh, we're about to turn the corner. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, uh, what, what's a little better this week? And does that sound like what we're getting out of Baghdad these days? Okay. And uh, the second thing uh, that a lot of people don't think about is secret terror. If you stood up and said anything about what was really going on, then you were a defeatist, you were unpatriotic, and uh, the Gestapo would come around in the middle of the night, and a week later your family would get a letter saying, gee, sorry, he was killed trying to escape. Secret terror. Well, do we have secret terror in this country? Ask Paul Wellstone. Ask John F. Kennedy. Ask Martin Luther King. Ask uh, Albert Lowenstein. Ask a number of people who have tried to make a mark for peace, for love, for progress in this country, and somehow they always meet with a fatal accident. Secret terror. Now, is that a coincidence of history? I think not. Particularly when you consider that the patriarch of the Bush family, Prescott Bush, was prosecuted under the Trading with the Enemies Act in late 1942, in the middle of World War II, as being nothing but a financial front man for Hitler and the Nazis. Okay? And, but he was only stripped of his holdings in Union Banking Corporation, and he was fined very heavily, which wasn't a big deal for him. He had plenty of money, and the harem and money behind him. But why was it more made of that? Well, how many of you all have been in the military? All right. Don't we love the United Service Organization, the USO? God, we love the USO. That's where you go and get a little bit of home, no matter where you are, you get coffee, donuts, get to meet girls. In the summer of 1942, when Prescott Bush undoubtedly knew he was under investigation for his dealings with the Nazis, he founded the USO. He wasn't stupid. 
How are you going to prosecute the founder of the USO in the middle of World War II as being the Nazi front man? It would have been a propaganda disaster. So he skated. Just like all these wealthy people skate. Henry Kissinger cannot go to certain countries today because he's under indictment for war crimes. And we know that he was the architect for about 20 or 30 years of the for very foreign policy that has gotten us into this terrorist mess, right? They say they hate our freedom and democracy, but let me tell you folks, I've traveled around the world, they don't hate our freedom and democracy, they just want a little bit for themselves, you know? And who was the architect of this that's keeping them down and trying to win their economic servitude but Henry Kissinger? So when 9 11 happens, and let's just jump back briefly, Pearl Harbor happened, the next day Congress had an investigation. The security assassination happened. Within a week, Johnson had appointed that horrendous whitewash Warren Commission, but at least they had an investigation. Going on two years after 9-11, George Bush was still dragging his feet, okay? And then when they finally, public pressure, the families of 9-11 victims finally put the screws to him, who does he appoint? Henry Kissinger. That was, that was, uh, that was such a, uh, flipping the bird to the American public that it didn't last. So they quickly got rid of him and instead got Thomas King and Lee Hamilton, two ranking Council on Foreign Relations members. And there is one of the parallels between the Kennedy assassination and 9-11. Every time there's some big event in this country and there's a big question about what really happens, they turn to the CFR to provide the people who will tell us what really happened. And that brings to mind my experience of 9-11. I, I, my wife called me and said, get on the TV, something's happened in New York. And like most of you, I was there on the television. The, I did not see the North Tower struck. Nobody saw the North Tower struck until the next day when the French documentary team's film became available, except George Bush. George Bush, not once, but twice, several times, said that he saw the plane strike the North Tower before he went in that classroom in Florida. And he, he rose on, he says, I'm a pilot, and I thought to myself, well, boy, what a bad pilot, you know? How did he see it? Nobody else saw it. Were they monitored it? it, was, it you'll find in my book that uh, they, they said that they had a special communication system between uh, the Pentagon and, uh, and uh, Bush's Secret Service. Were they, were they watching the attack take place? Was that another slip? Kind of like Donald Rumsfeld when he slipped and told Parade Magazine and mentioned the two planes striking the tower and the missile that hit the Pentagon. Okay? Is that a Freudian slip? Or maybe just a Freudian slip? But anyway, that's, so it's all just so obvious that there are these things going on that we don't get told about. We mentioned false flag operations. We all know what a false flag operation is. Don't you remember in grade school when you were sent by your buddy in class and when the teacher turned her back you fire a spit wad at some girl up there because you were too shy to actually ask her out for a date. Hit her in the back of the head. She turns around and you turn around and sit there and act like nothing's happening. Your buddy's laughing and he gets blamed. That's a false flag operation. It's, it's the oldest game in the book. They've used it for years. Uh, uh, again, Hitler uh, and the Nazis. Look at the parallels there. They, uh, in the beginning of January 1933, Germany was at peace and it was a republic. 
Okay? The Weimar Republic. And Hitler was only the chancellor, which was comparable to our vice president. And like our vice president up until Cheney, they had very little power. But suddenly, on February the 22nd, 1933, their parliament building caught fire, the Reichstag. And let me tell you folks, that in that slower, gentler time, the burning of their parliament was as much a shock and a horror to those Germans as 9-11 was to us. And Hitler immediately takes the bull on the horns and says, give me the power and I'll respond to this terrorist attack. And he pushed through something called the Enabling Act. Okay? And then suddenly, all of a sudden, it required uh, national identity. identity cards, it required gun confiscation. They set up detention centers for dissidents, which quickly evolved into the concentration camp system. Uh, does that begin to sound familiar? And again, his grandfather knew all about it. So I don't think that's just an accident in history. But then that, what Alex brought out about the, uh, about the uh, tax being within the government, I know a lot of people, some of you even may think, well, wait a minute, would Americans allow a tax on other Americans? Unfortunately, yes, they will. Pearl Harbor is now, beyond dispute, was known in advance by Franklin Roosevelt, George Marshall, a handful of others in Washington. They allowed it to happen. 3,000 American dead to achieve their political agenda, which was to get an enraged and unified American public into World War II. Now, I'm not going to debate the merits of that. Maybe, maybe that was necessary, but the point is, that happened. And then that brings us to Operation Northwoods, a little more recent. Let's see if this doesn't sound familiar. An aircraft at Eglin Air Force Base will be painted and numbered as an exact duplicate for a civil registered aircraft. At designated time, the duplicate will be substituted for the actual civil aircraft and will be boarded with selected passengers, all boarded under carefully prepared aliases. The actual registered aircraft could be converted to a drone, a remote controlled airplane, and then a rendezvous point, the passenger carrying aircraft will descend to a minimum altitude and go directly to an auxiliary field at Eglin Air Force Base where arrangements will have been made to evacuate the passengers and return the aircraft to its original status. The drone aircraft, meanwhile, will continue to fly the filed flight pan and when over Cuba, the drone will begin transmitting on international distress frequency a Mayday message stating that he's under attack by Cuban MiG aircraft. This trans transmission will be interrupted by the destruction of the aircraft which will be triggered by radio signal, remote control. Does that sound eerily similar to what we saw on 9-11? We've got these airplanes uh, by hijackers who we've been told uh, hijacked the airplanes and yet half of them have been found to be still alive in the Middle East, okay? So we don't know who they are, all right? And they, they could be laying on the radar they, and they could be painted the planes. We don't know, but this was a plan advanced by the Pentagon in 1962. And this is not some new exotic technology. I had an airline pilot tell me in the late 80s that he was redundant. I said, what do you mean? He said, the computers now run these big Boeing 737s, 757s, 767s. He said, I'm just there in case the computer breaks down. All right? In the summer of 2001, a Boeing 737 lifted off from Edwards Air Force Base in California and flew all the way to Australia, flew 12 missions around Australia and then flew all the way back to Edwards, landed safely, all the while no one on board. So they got global hawk technology today, plus 
this false flag thing is very real. They have something called the Proactive Preemptive Operations Group. It's called P2OG. And it is CIA military operatives specializing in covert action, information warfare, intelligence, and cover and deception. And their job is to simulate terrorist acts, okay, so that they can draw the real terrorist out of the woodwork. Well, how easy is it to be telling some of these guys, uh, we got a little operation here, and we're, we, we're going to set off some bombs over in the London subway, okay, that just happens to coincide with a drill. And we, he's already covered that extensively, so I will skip over them. But here's the burning question. If Al-Qaeda is behind the terrorist plots, who's behind Al-Qaeda? That's the question to be asking. Uh, when these Pakistanis are caught in England and a whole group of them are arrested, some of which, by the way, have already been let go, and they're poor, they're desperate, most of them didn't even have passports, which causes me to ask, how are they going to buy plane tickets? And of course, we're told that they're going to be mixing up these chemicals on the plane, and yes, it is true that uh, within certain toiletries, household products, you can get acetone, sulfur, uh, hydrogen peroxide, but you have to have very concentrated amounts. You have to mix them in just the right property. You have to drip in the uh, active ingredient, and it's going to stink like acetone and sulfur. How are you supposed to do this on a moving airplane? And the key key thing is, is that if you allow, while you're trying to mix up these chemicals into a deadly concoction, uh, if the temperature gets above 50 degrees, they become inert. They won't work. So, and the whole thing's just ridiculous. Um, and when something happens like this, you have to ask yourself, well, if these are such sneaky, devious terrorists, how'd they find them? They found them because, and this has come out in the mainstream media, they had insiders. They had informants. Now that leads us to some other terrorist plots. Remember in June when they said they arrested the seven guys in, in Florida and they were, they were going to go to Chicago and blow up the Sears Tower? Okay? And then they said they're probably connected to Al-Qaeda. And that made all the headlines just like the British bunch did. And then, though, if you really followed it, you find out that they really weren't connected to Al-Qaeda. In fact, they were just some poor black kids from a ghetto that an FBI informant had pulled them together, harangued them, got them all fired up, probably said, we're going to do this, this, and they went, yeah, yeah, you know, and then they're arrested. They probably didn't even have the money to get to Chicago, much less explosives, which were never found. 1993, the North Tower of the World Trade Center was bombed. Everybody remember that? Hey, man. And then they said, well, who would have thought that they would attack the World Trade Center? Well, it was already attacked. 1993. And, and again, this was Al-Qaeda. This was the Arab terrorist. And yet, in sworn courtroom testimony, we found out that it was an FBI informant was inside, who was telling about him, helped drumming this whole thing up, then had a pang of conscience, went to his FBI superiors and said, listen, this is terrible. He said, but I think I can substitute some phony explosives for the real explosives, and uh, then we can nab them and there won't be any danger to anybody. And the FBI said, no, don't do that. So the, this is court documented testimony. The 93 bombing of the World Trade Center Tower was known beforehand and condoned by our FBI. Yes, folks, they will hurt other Americans. Uh, in Iraq, we have some very odd things going on. Uh, in Alex's uh, documentary, we saw the two British SAS guys arrested, dressed as Arabs, carrying explosives. Where were they going? What were they going to do? There's also been some instances, very little reported, in our media. 
Uh, Dr. Ahmad Kaduri, who was uh, a prominent uh, person in Iraq, tells the story of a taxi driver who was stopped at a U.S. military checkpoint and then was taken over to a military base, held and questioned for a long time, and then said, okay, we're going to let you go, but you're going to have to go drive over to this police station over here to get your license back. And he said, you better hurry because they close pretty soon. So he started driving, trying to get to the police station to get his license back, and he noticed the helicopter was following him. He also noticed that his taxi seemed to be kind of sluggish and heavier than what it had been before. So he pulled over and checked out, and what does he find? A hundred kilograms of explosive hidden under his back seat. Okay? And this wasn't the only example. Another man, uh, the same plan happened to him. He was stopped at a checkpoint. They said, oh, you're going to have to drive over to this police station to get your license back. But on the way over there, fortunately for him, his car broke down. He got into a shop and they found explosives packed into his trunk and into the side panels of his car. And this was after being stopped and held by American authorities. Is this the P2OG in operation? Now, I'll give you one more that you'll find in my book that you don't hear anything about. In um, May of 2002, while we were still in a frenzy about 9-11, late one night a pretty wide awake Florida deputy sheriff saw a speeding truck and he stopped it. The guy was wearing a black outfit. He had a 45 and a shoulder holster. He had explosive materials and caps and a shotgun on the back seat. Needless to say, he was arrested. Then the deputy sheriff got to thinking, wait a minute, I remember seeing this truck, I think, back at this Florida Power and Light station so he got back up, they go to the Florida uh, power station, and they find the tire tracks that match to the truck, and they find an explosive device planted in the power station. Well, the guy they arrested turns out to be Army Specialist Derek Lawrence Peterson, who was, had been assigned to one of those bases in Georgia where we train our elite soldiers. His excuse? He said, oh, I was practicing my night missions. Now, when I heard that, I followed this story and I found out that two weeks later he had still not been arraigned, but he was being held. Now, I thought to myself, this is going to go one way or another. If this guy was just some nutball who managed to get the United States Army in the heightened atmosphere and tension that we have now about terrorism, they will throw the book at him to prove to everyone that we will not tolerate terrorist acts. But then on the other hand, I said, however, if he's carrying out a covert operation, we'll never hear about this story again. Have any of you heard about this story? I don't think so. Yeah, Lee Harvey McVeigh. All right, one more quick thing here. Uh, the good news is I've got a real treat for you here. I am not going to keep you long, but I'm trying to give you some information that you might otherwise uh, not have gotten. I want to tell you the story. You'll find this detail in my book, The Terror Conspiracy. In uh, March of 2002, in Pakistan, they captured a fellow by the name of Abu Zabidah. And old Abu, according to Ari Flasher, who was then the White House press spokesman, said, this is the top Al-Qaeda chieftain that we've caught to date. And he said, we're going to make him talk. Well, they did. Not by torture, that didn't work. But they tricked him, and you can find out how they tricked him in my book. But they got Olavu to reveal that he was actually working for three princes of Saudi Arabia. And he, he was being handled through this uh, air marshal mirror 
of Pakistan who was connected to the Pakistani ISI. And if you know anything about intelligence, you'll know that the Pakistani ISI was trained and funded and is generally considered a branch of our CIA. So now we find out that Al-Qaeda is actually being ordered around by these Saudis. Could this be why the 28 page on a report on the Saudi connection to 9-11 was sequestered and classified that was prepared by the joint Senate and uh, House committee to look into 9-11? Could this be why that the 9-11 Commission just disdainfully refused to look at any connections between Saudi Arabia? Oh, and by the way, all three Saudi princes and Air Marshal Mir died within weeks of each other once this information became known, okay? Only one of them, a, one of the Saudi princes, they said he died of a heart attack. He was 42 years old. The other three were killed in car crashes and plane crashes. Secret terror. So now we see that Al-Qaeda, who, by the way, in case there's somebody here that doesn't know this, was created by our Central Intelligence Agency back in the 80s to draw Arab mercenaries and Muslim fighters to go to Afghanistan to fight the Soviets. You'll also find that in the 80s, Osama bin Laden was brought to this country and trained and given arms and, and uh, funds to go back to promote his Al-Qaeda network. What you also don't know is that Al-Qaeda trained the Kosovo Liberation Army, which was our side in the Kosovo conflict. They had been operating, Al-Qaeda has, as a force, an armed force, fighting for the interest of U.S. oil companies. It's all documented. So, if, what are we seeing here? Are we seeing this same P2OG, this same false flag operations? Now quickly I'll run through the parallels between the Kennedy assassination and 9-11. Within an hour or so, even at a time when nobody could have possibly known what really had happened, one man is named as the suspect and culprit and perpetrator. Lee Harvey Oswald, Osama bin Laden. Speaking of Osama bin Laden, where is he? I think he, I think he sold me gasoline at that little gas station over on Gaston Avenue. And by the way, it was Osama bin Laden's older brother, Salim bin Laden, who came over to Texas in the 80s and uh, by very good information was the person that put up the money to get George W. Bush into the oil business with his Augusto Energy of Houston, Texas. <laughs> Official announcements in both cases, which were said, we've got it. When you look closer, they were either withdrawn or they turned, the hat, it turned out to have no substance whatsoever. Uh, does anybody remember that they claim they found the passport of one of the 9-11 hijackers on the street in New York? Of course, the planes were just disintegrated, the bodies were just disintegrated, but, uh, but they found their paper passport. Mm -hmm. and, and then you have these weird theories, you know, uh, I, I covered courts long enough to know that if you have enough money, you can hire an expert to go into court and tell you how many angels can dance on the end of a head of a pen, right? So in the Kennedy assassination, once the Zapruder film became public and everybody could see him go back and to the left, back and to the left, okay? How did they explain this? Well, they got a government hired expert who gave us the uh, the jet effect. The jet effect says that 
Kennedy was actually struck from behind by Oswald in the sixth floor window, and it blew out the front of his head. And when that happened, all the compressed brain matter and blood and everything gooshed out, and it formed like a jet, and it threw his head to the roof. Okay. I said, don't laugh. That's the serious scientific argument that they presented. That's the jet effect, okay? Never mind that the autopsy photographs show that his forehead and the front of his face is perfectly okay. And all the doctors who saw him at Parkland and the autopsy doctors said he had a gaping hole in the rear of his head, which would have been an exit wound. Now to 9-11, we get the zipper effect, okay? Which is that all the bolts holding the floors together on the towers were bolted in and when some of these bolts gave way because of the heat and the destruction of the aircraft that it put a strain on all the rest of the bolts, all the bolts came unbolted and you had a zipper effect and one floor fell and then it pancaked all the way down. The only problem is, if you look closely, you'll find that those floors were not bolted. They were welded. Okay, but well, I'm not going to get into that whole thing. Most of you are familiar with the uh, strange uh, collapse of the Twin Towers and, of course, the even stranger collapse of Building 7, which you saw repeatedly in Alex's uh, great documentary. By the way, did everybody notice that the top of Building 7, when it begins to go, the top sags, the middle sags, and it folds in on itself? And if you'll see the pictures of the of the ruins uh, after the dust settled, all the walls are caved in. This was a building implosion. This is the way they bring buildings down. And in fact, Building 7 was nestled between the Verizon building on one hand and the U.S. Post Office on the other, neither of which received significant damage. And think about a building collapsing. Wouldn't it just kind of go helter-skelter in every which way? Think about the top of the South Tower, which we all saw. There, there was about, what, 10 or 20 stories there. And it began to lean over to about a 45 degree angle. I remember thinking, watching this, when it was happening live, and I'm going, holy cow, it's going to fall into the streets of New York. It's going to be more widespread devastation. And yet, all of a sudden, it just goes and totally collapses down. Now, those top floors did not have burning jet flu. Those top floors had not been hit by aircraft. Wouldn't you expect that those top floors would end up sitting on the ground? But they didn't, did they? It was totally converted to pulverized dust. How does that happen? And I'm not going to get into the scientific thing, but I will give you a clue. If you were wanting to bring, to do something along that line, and you had access to exotic, cutting-edge technology that was not known to the general public, then you could do pretty much anything you wanted to, and then you'd come out with the most cockamamie cover story that you could come up with, and nobody would be in a position to seriously refute you. And even the experts would scratch their head and go, as they have, well, it sure looked like a building demolition, but I guess it wasn't. <laughs> Dr. Gene Corley, oh, another parallel. In both instances, competent authorities were prevented from looking at the evidence. In the Kennedy assassination, it was the autopsy doctors at Bethesda. They were under military guidance and were not allowed to even examine President Kennedy's clothes. They were not allowed to do normal autopsy procedures. A dead wino in Dallas got a better autopsy than the President of the United States. Okay? And in 9-11, who investigated the World Trade Center anyway? Was it the New York Fire Department? New York Police Department? No. Well, was it the FBI or the CIA? No. It was FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which at that time was under the direct control of the President of the United States. And they hired a 26-man team. I say man, maybe that's chauvinistic. Might have been a woman on there. They were hired 26 engineers to 
examine and tell us what happened to the World Trade Center towers, but according to Dr. W. Jean Corley, who headed that group, they were blocked, stonewalled, were given the bones rushed through there, told they couldn't go in buildings five or six, they, and don't look at building seven, and by the way, no, you can't study the steel. They were not able to examine the steel, and this is why we still don't know what truly happened. In both cases, Kennedy, 9-11, vital critical evidence was taken up and then disappeared. Were any of y'all alive and living here in Dallas at the time of the Kennedy assassination? Yeah, okay. Then, then you'll remember what I'm telling you here. They were actually big ads in the paper as well as news stories asking for anyone who had taken photographs or films in Dealey Plaza to please come down and turn it over to the FBI, right? Because it was evidence. Have we ever seen those? No. Did anybody ever get them back? No. That's just blatant destruction of evidence. And in the case of 9-11, they cut up all of the steel that was in the World Trade Center and they shipped it overseas before anybody had a chance to see what was going on. Of course, same deal, same company, by the way, controlled demolitions that uh, cleaned up after Oklahoma City was then called in to, uh, to New York to uh, clean up at the World Trade Center. This prompted Bill Manning, the editor of Fire Engineering, which is a fireman's industry publication, very well respected, it's been around for almost 100 years. He said, for more than three months, structural steel from the World Trade Center has been and continues to be cut up and sold for scrap. Crucial evidence that could answer the many questions about high-rise building design practices and performance under fire conditions is on the slow boat to China. Perhaps never to be seen again in America until you buy your next car. <laughs> he said, he called, and there were three, there were other prominent fire officials in this same publication who called FEMA's investigation of the collapse of the World Trade Center, quote, a half-baked farce. Now, folks, I think we deserve better than that. By the way, let me have one little coda on Building 7. Silverstein Properties had only acquired the lease to Building 7 just six weeks before 9-11. Uh, in February 2002, Silverstein Properties won $861 million from industrial risk insurers uh, that paid off on Building 7. His investment had been $386 million, which means there was a $500 million profit made from the loss of Building 7. $500 million, that'd almost be enough to make you torch your house yourself, wouldn't it? We've got all of this evidence locked away in government files. You already know it. I know we're up here preaching to the choir here. You know about the missing uh, tapes from the Pentagon security cameras, etc. But I would mention one other thing that I, you might not have thought about. The Pentagon, indeed, is one of the most protected buildings in the country. They have automated missile batteries. Any aircraft that approaches the Pentagon that does not send out a friendly coded signal is fired upon. Why were none of these missile batteries in operation and firing upon Flight 77? Was it sending out the friendly coded message? Uh, exactly. But we won't go there because uh, we're all expected to believe that a big Boeing 757 with a 124-foot wingspan and a four-story high tail can all just squeeze right into that little 20 by 20-foot hole that we see clearly pictured in the photographs taken before the side of the wall collapsed. And even after the side of the wall collapsed, it still wasn't wide enough to accommodate that jet. But we're told, oh, well, you know, it just folded back, the tail folded back. It's like a little torpedo. It went in there and blew up and it with such intensity and frosty that the entire plane was just immolated. And that was the end of that. Well, explain to me this. 
I interviewed, and you'll hear her story in my new book, a woman named April Gallup. April Gallup was in the Pentagon when something blew up. She picked herself up out of the rubble. She found her small child, and together they crawled through the hole in the west side of the Pentagon. How could she have survived if it was such a heat that uh, such heat that it destroyed the airplane? And by the way, this is how cockamamie it gets. First off, the official version was that Flight 77 hit the ground and then ricocheted into the building. But they had to change their story because too many people had got there and taken pictures with their digital cameras, put them on the internet, and it was clear that the lawn in front of the Pentagon was green and unmolested, no problem there, so they changed their story. Oh, well, okay, it didn't hit the ground ricochet, and this is where we get the story about it punched a little hole there and just wings folded back, and it just went in there and blew up, you know, with this great intensity. And, well, where are the pieces of the plane? Well, it just disintegrated. But then, a week or two later, the FBI announces that we have identified all the victims on Flight 77. And how? By their fingerprints. Wait a minute. You haven't got pieces of the plane because it's all just totally disintegrated, but you got fingerprints? And they were asked about that. So now the FBI says, oh, well, yeah, yeah, we got some wreckage. We got wreckage too. Yeah, it's all over in a hangar somewhere. All right, think about it, folks. In every major air disaster, the, the uh, National Transportation Safety Board gathers up every little piece of that aircraft and they take it to a hangar or a big old warehouse somewhere and they reassemble it to try to determine what had happened to that aircraft. And I simply offer this challenge. Show me a picture of the wreckage of Flight 77 and I'll shut up. But they haven't shown us that, have they? And they won't because they can't. Because I don't know what truly happened at the Pentagon. If you'll read my book, Terror Conspiracy, you'll find Barbara Honiger, who is the author of October Surprise, and who uh, still works for the Department of Defense and has had unprecedented access to some of those Pentagon people. She makes a very compelling argument that it was bombs that went off in the World Trade Center. She also tells about NORAD General Larry Arnold, who said that after something had exploded at the Pentagon, he ordered a, uh, a military jet to buzz the building to see what had happened. And he said, without a doubt, this uh, jet, which buzzed the building and then reported back that the pilot said he couldn't see any signs of an aircraft, that was the radar blip that did a 170 degree spiraling turn, level off at ground level and went on, that they have tried to say was Flight 77. So there's a lot we don't know. I can't tell you specifically what happened, but what I can tell you what didn't happen. A Boeing 757 did not hit the Pentagon. Also, Flight 93 over western Pennsylvania did not get flown into the ground. How can I say that? because it left an eight mile long debris trail. That means that aircraft was coming apart in midair. Now was it shot down as some people believe? Or could it have been a bomb on board as was caught on the uh, cockpit voice recorder? And was that bomb triggered by the hijackers in a suicide mission? Or was it triggered remotely as we see in uh, the Northwoods documents? I don't know, but we don't know because there's never been an honest and in-depth and objective investigation. They mentioned the Trans-Texas Corridor, and I just have to briefly mention this. I'm going to wrap up pretty quick. I went to one of those public hearings, too, and I felt like I was be listening to a used car salesman. There was a public hearing on an issue that most people didn't even know about until just a day or two before. They get there, they tell us they're going to run this huge superhighway from Laredo all the way to the Oklahoma border. It's going to be the biggest land grab in Texas history. It's going to be a toll road. You probably won't even be able to get on it or afford it, and certainly not at $5 a gallon gasoline, which we will probably have in a 
new three or four years, and they say it's going to take 50 years to get this uh, project completed. And all the amenities, the gas stations, the restaurants, the hotels, are all going to be run by that Spanish company that Rick Perry is uh, giving exclusivity to. And uh, they'll also, uh, a foreign country, company, the same company, will be building this boondoggle. Centra, yes, uh, that is part owned by the Prince of Spain. What's happening, folks, and, and Alex would get up and he would really bombast on this one. We're going back into medieval feudalism where you either have no money and you're a serf or you got lots of money and you're running the show and even our infrastructure is now being turned over to the same royal families that our ancestors rested from during our fights for freedom. We're told that our economy's doing great. We're the richest nation in the world. If this is so, why is George Bush selling off the Oklahoma Turnpike, the New Jersey Turnpike, bridges, roads, public works built by public money, and he's selling it to foreign investors? Why is it, as I saw a story just the other day, that some of those top neocons, Cheney and uh, Philip Zelikow and uh, Rice, and uh, Richard Pearl, they're all buying villas in the states outside the United States. They're going to go to southern France. They're going to go to South America. They're going to get the hell out of Dodge. And why is that? Believe it or not, I believe that was voiced by the senior Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush, who in 1992 uh, had an interview with that old workhorse White House correspondent, Sarah McClendon. And as according to Sarah McClendon, he actually told her, he said, you know, if the American people ever find out what we've done to this country, they're going to chase us down the street and lynch us. So, I don't have all the answers, but I certainly have the questions. Why can't the FAA and NORAD get their stories straight? You know, the 9-11 Commission now, we're told, thought about charging them with perjury. Who initiated and authorized the war game exercises that befuddled our natural defense system? How did the hijackers learn of the date of those war game exercises? We didn't even know about it for a year. That is the proof that 9-11 was an inside job. They could only have gotten that information from inside sources. Who in the U.S. military provided the weapons-grade anthrax used to intimidate Congress and kill five persons, sickening 14? Who specifically blocked investigations into the terrorist probe prior to 9-11? Who has allowed Afghan opium farmers to repant 500,000 acres of poppies since the Taliban were deposed, who had almost wiped out the poppy crop? Who is truly behind Al-Qaeda? The orders and funding for Al-Qaeda can be documented back through Pakistani ISI to Saudi Arabia, but where does it go from there? In the year 2000, uh, summer of 2000, the Bush family went to Saudi Arabia as guests of the Saudi royals, and specifically, their old buddies, the Bin Laden family. Is it truly a worldwide terrorist organization managed by a Muslim Turk with a laptop computer in a cave in Afghanistan? Or is this another false flag operation? And are we under the thumb? And we all know the answer to that. And all I'm going to say is, is that they have built all this on fear. They, they know that by creating fear, they can make everybody stampede and do their will and they'll put up with almost anything for the false hope of security. And I'll tell you this, pardon me Alex, but I'm going to bombast myself now. The fear stops here!